In the days when gun emplacements were subject to the fire of short-range naval guns with flat trajectories, the disappearing carriage was a practical mount for the 12-inch gun. But the bomber, which can pound a gun emplacement from above, and modern long-range naval armament have greatly lessened the advantages of the disappearing carriage. Thus, it became most important for fixed seacoast guns to match the increased ranges of naval artillery. The barbette carriage was adopted for the 12-inch gun, enabling it to fire about 18 miles. The barbette carriage also provides further advantages in the simplicity and ruggedness of its design and in its low cost. This is the 12-inch gun, model 1895M1, mounted on the barbette carriage model 1917. The gun is capable of firing in any direction and can be elevated as high as 35 degrees. This greater elevation adds between six and seven miles to the range of the gun. The gun on the disappearing carriage has a range of about 18,000 yards. On the barbette carriage, its range is increased to about 30,000 yards. The emplacement of the barbette carriage is in the open, with little or no protection from the sea. To minimize any possible damage resulting from enemy action, bomb-proof casemates are being constructed for many of these guns. While this eliminates all-around fire, enabling the protected gun to traverse only 145 degrees, it leaves the gun invulnerable except to a direct hit from the front. Normally, the battery has two guns, located about 140 yards apart. Observation and spotting stations are located about 9,000 yards apart at opposite ends of a baseline. Under shell-proof cover are the battery commander station, a plotting room, and ammunition storage facilities. Electrical power plant installations operate the guns. Now for the gun itself. The weight of the gun and cradle assembly is carried on two cradle trunnions resting in the upper part of the gun carriage. One of the trunnions is shown here. The top carriage, which includes all parts of the carriage above the traversing rollers, extends down into the pit. The breech block is the slotted screw type, tray supported. The breech block operating mechanism is of the stockette type which is described in another training film. The gun is normally fired electrically. To fire electrically, the firing magneto is used. The gun may also be fired by lanyard. Mounted above the barrel on a line parallel to the axis of the bore 
is a 75 millimeter gun used for sub-caliber firing. The gun is elevated and depressed either from the upper platform or from the lower platform. The operation can be performed by hand, but electrically operated speed gears are normally used. The gun must be depressed to a nearly level position for loading and returned to its firing elevation. This is done efficiently and speedily by Waterbury speed gears. To energize the speed gears, the rain setter slowly pulls the starting box lever all the way to the left. He then depresses the clutch pedal, engaging the power mechanism. The gun can be elevated at varied rates of speed. To elevate, the hand wheel is turned clockwise until the desired speed is shown on the indicator. The gun is now being elevated by power and can be stopped at any elevation by the hand wheel control. To depress the gun, the same procedure is followed, except that the hand wheel is turned counterclockwise. A range disc mounted on the left side of the carriage makes possible the rapid setting of accurate elevations. For final accurate settings, the clutch pedal can be disengaged and the hand wheel used manually. An adjustable index is available for making corrections for inclinations of the base ring or for making calibration corrections. Some guns also have a range disc on the lower level. It takes about 55 seconds to depress the gun from the firing position to the loading position, load it, elevate it to the firing position, lay it, and check it. Let's time this gun section. The gun is traversed on a base ring mounted around the circumference of the pit. Conical roller bearings ride on the base ring, carrying the weight of the top carriage and gun. The gun may be traversed from the upper platform by a slow motion hand wheel. It may also be traversed from the lower platform by slow motion hand wheel or by a fast motion traversing crank. The azimuth circle is mounted above the traversing rack. An adjustable index is mounted on the base ring. A micrometer adjustment sets the gun to an accuracy of one one hundredth of a degree. The gun itself is carried in a cradle through which it slides during recoil and counter recoil. <laughs> The cylinders of the recoil and recuperating systems are joined to this cradle. The piston rods are attached to a yoke which moves with the gun. The pit provides space for the recoil of the piece when fired at the higher elevations. The personnel manning the equipment is organized into three sections. Battery headquarters, firing section, and maintenance section. 
This chart gives you a picture of the battery organization. The battery headquarters under the range officer consists of the command detail, the range section, and the communication section. The firing section under the battery executive consists of two gun sections and the executive officer's detail. The maintenance section consists of the personnel for supply and mess. Each chief of section marches his section to the immediate vicinity of its station. Each gun emplacement is manned by a gun section, which is made up of a gun squad and an ammunition squad. The section marches to the rear of the gun and takes position with the ammunition squad on the left of the gun squad. Identifying markings have been placed on the uniforms to make it easier to follow the duties of each individual. The chief of section is in charge of both the gun squad and the ammunition squad. Range commander. Gun pointer. Range setter. Azimuth display board. Range display board. Azimuth recorder. Range recorder. DC telephone. Chief of breeze. One breach detail. Two breach detail. Three breach detail. Four breach detail. There are 28 men in the gun squad. Ten covers in detail. Gun shot truck. Ten shot truck. Twelve rammer. Thirteen rammer. Fourteen rammer. Fifteen rammer. Sixteen power tray. Seventeen power tray. Eighteen powder tray. Nineteen powder tray. Boy sponger. Chief of ammunition. Twenty-one. Twenty-two. There are 18 men in the ammunition squad. Twenty-eight. An artillery mechanic is assigned to each gun section. Thirty-four. Thirty-six. 38. When ordered to posts, the section breaks ranks, each man to perform a prescribed duty. Gun section. Tension. Detail. Halt. The ammunition squad proceeds to the magazine. The squad is divided into two details, one to serve powder and the other to serve projectiles. The artillery mechanic is responsible for the condition of the storeroom and supplies for the gun emplacements. He is also responsible for any repairs or adjustments that can be made with the assistance of members of the gun section. He or his assistant issues such equipment, tools, oils, paints, and cleaning materials as are necessary for the service and care of the gun and accessories. Members of the gun squad get the equipment and tools necessary for drill or firing. For those guns which use case two pointing, the gun pointer obtains the telescopic sight. He places it on the sight standard and takes position to its rear. However, if the azimuth circle for case three pointing is to be used, the gun pointer takes position where he can see the azimuth index. The range setter takes position facing the range disc. He places the starting box control lever in position and removes the range disc cover. He attaches the telephone. Number one procures cotton waste, lubricating oil, a sponge, and a pail. He places them in a convenient position and takes post facing the breech one yard to the rear and at the right. Number two obtains cotton waste and takes post facing the breech one yard to the rear and at the left. Number three procures a primer pouch, primers, a punch, drill and reamer, the firing mechanism, and a lanyard. He takes post by the right side of the carriage. Number four obtains the operating crank for the breech mechanism. He takes post facing the breech two feet to the right and on a line with its face. Numbers one, two, three, and four make up the breech detail under the command of the chief of breech who sees that each man has procured the necessary cleaning material and equipment. 
He takes post facing the breach two paces to the rear. Numbers five and six, the elevating detail, take posts at the elevating crank. Numbers seven and eight, the traversing detail, take posts at the traversing crank. Numbers nine and 10, the truck detail, secure the shot trucks. After inspecting and oiling them, they are left for the ammunition squad to load. After the first truck is loaded, it is turned over to the truck detail, who push it out to a position at the rear of the gun. Number nine takes post on the right and number 10 on the left. If preparing for a dummy drill, however, the truck detail secures a truck loaded with a dummy projectile and takes post at the rear of and on a line with the gun as before. Numbers 11 and 14 procure the rammer from the magazine. They place it on the prop. Number 11 takes post about two yards from the head of the rammer on its right, within reach of the staff and facing the gun. Number 14's post is four yards to the left of number 11. Numbers 15, 13, and 12 are also members of the rammer detail, but at first have other duties to perform. For drill, number 15 gets the extractor for the dummy projectile. Number 12 obtains a funnel and a measure containing light recoil oil. Number 13 gets a wrench for the filling plug. Number 15 places the extractor near the rammer and takes post four yards to the right of number 11 facing the rammer. Number 12 takes post at the recoil cylinder and number 13 takes post near number 12. If the battery is equipped with powder trays, numbers 16, 17, 18, 19, the powder detail, examine and clean the trays and turn them over to the ammunition squad for loading. They then take post on the emplacement near the magazine entrance and stand ready to serve powder when called for. If preparing for drill, a powder tray loaded with dummy powder is turned over to the powder detail, who take posts on the side of the gun nearest the magazine and about six yards to the rear of the breech. If the battery is equipped with combination shot and powder trucks, they are loaded by the ammunition squad and are held near the magazine entrance until called for. Number 20, the sponge detail, gets the sponge and rests it on a vessel containing sponging liquid at the left rear of the breech. While the gun and ammunition squads perform the duties just shown, the display board operators procure their equipment. This includes chalk, blackboard erasers, and telephones. They take posts at the display boards located near the gun on the flank where visibility is best. One operator is responsible for posting range data the other for azimuth data. They get this by telephone from the plotting room, where the range section determines the range and azimuth, or deflection, at which the gun must be set for firing. There is another telephone operator with a direct connection to the battery command post. Besides these men, there are a range recorder and an azimuth recorder. Having procured pencils and forms, they take posts, the range recorder convenient to the range setter, and the azimuth recorder at a point where he can check the azimuth reading on the gun platform. All the details have reached their posts practically at the same time. Now comes the command. Examine gun. At this command, the chief of section begins an examination of the gun carriage and all materiel. The purpose of examine gun is to test the important mechanisms to ensure that they are in proper working order and that the gun is ready for firing. Numbers one and four remove the breech cover and place it aside. Number 14 removes the muzzle cover. The gun pointer examines the magneto and the electric circuit. He also goes into the pit 
and verifies the adjustment of the azimuth index. Under his supervision, numbers seven and eight examine and test the traversing mechanism. This done, they clean and oil it. The range setter examines the elevating mechanism, including the range disc. He goes into the pit and examines the gears as numbers five and six elevate and depress the gun. If it is necessary to clean and oil the gears, numbers five and six do it under the range setter's supervision. Numbers one and four get the improvised pit platform and put it in place. Number four attaches the breech block hand crank. Numbers one and four clean and oil the breech mechanism. Number 11 assists the breech detail. They clean and oil the breech block. Number two cleans and oils the breech recess and the gas check seat. In this, he is assisted by number 20 if necessary. Number three examines and cleans the vent and primer seat. He then assembles the firing mechanism and places it in position. If a lanyard is to be used, he coils it in a convenient place. The chief of breach supervises the breach detail in cleaning and putting material in condition for firing. He also examines the breach recess chamber, bore, breech mechanism, and breech block. He pays special attention to the safety devices. Number 13 opens the test plug to see if oil is needed in the recoil cylinder. If it is needed, he goes down into the pit to remove the filling plug. Assisted by number 12, he attaches the pipe and funnel.
Number 12 pours in the oil. When the cylinder is full, the gun commander inspects it. After inspection, number 13 removes the pipe. Then he secures the plug firmly. He takes post three yards to the rear of number 11. Number 12 replaces the funnel and measure and takes post three yards to the left of number 11. The display board operators clean the boards, put on telephone headsets, and test the connection to the plotting room. The range setter does the same. The gun commander completes his inspection of gun, carriage, and all materiel. He pays particular attention to the recoil cylinder and to the firing mechanism and safety devices. He carefully inspects the oiling of all moving parts. When he has finished his inspection and is satisfied that all men have completed their duties, he commands... Report! Traversing mechanism and telephone in order! Traversing mechanism and firing circuit in order! Elevating mechanism and telephone in order! Breach and firing mechanism in order! When the reports have been received from each detail, the gun commander reports to the chief of section Number one gun in order. This report is relayed through the executive officer to the battery commander. This is a 12-inch gun, model 1895M1, on barbet carriage, model 1917. It has a stocket-type breech mechanism. The device by which the rear end of the gun barrel is closed is called the breech block. It is equipped with a hand crank for opening and closing it rapidly, a firing mechanism which ignites the charge after it has been locked in, and an obturator which prevents the escape of gases to the rear during firing. The complete device is known as the breech mechanism. The block is the slotted screw type, tray supported. The tray, hinged about a vertical pin, supports the block when it is open. Watch the action of the breech block as the number four man opens and closes it. Notice that the circumference of the block is divided into 12 segments alternate segments being threaded about a single diameter. Now let's do it in slow motion. First, number four releases the catch. Then he turns the hand crank, rotating a worm and worm wheel, which drives a vertical pin. The vertical pin turns a compound gear, which first acts as a worm engaging a worm sector on the rear of the block, thus rotating the block about 30 degrees. When the compound gear reaches the end of the spiral cuttings, it is transformed from a worm to
to opinion, and its teeth engage a translating rack cut in a slotted sector of the block. As the crank continues to turn, the block is translated out of the breech recess onto the tray. When the block reaches the end of its travel, the tray latch is released from the breech. Continued turning of the crank rotates the tray around the hinge pin until the block is sufficiently out of the way for loading. The breech is closed by turning the crank counterclockwise. First, the tray swings back into closing position and engages the latch. Then the breech block moves forward into the breech recess. Finally, the block rotates until its threads are completely locked into those in the breech. Many guns in our fortifications are equipped with breech mechanisms of the translating roller type, model 1888, here shown on a 12-inch gun, disappearing carriage. In this type, two cranks are used, the rotating crank to turn the breech block within the breech recess, and the translating crank to move the block into or out of the recess. Here is how a well-trained breech detail opens and closes this breech block. Now, here is the same action in slow motion. To open it, the wing nut of the catch is turned to the left, releasing the rotating crank. The crank is then turned clockwise until it is stopped in its horizontal position by its catch. The translating crank is then turned briskly counterclockwise. When the block reaches the end of its travel, it stops short. The shock frees the tray latch from its catch. The tray and block are swung to the right until the securing latch engages. To close the breech, the securing latch is released. The tray and block are swung smartly to the left. The swing is continued until the tray butts against and is latched to the face of the breech. The translating crank is then turned clockwise until the breech is translated completely. The rotating crank is released as before and turned counterclockwise until it is stopped in a vertical position and is secured by its catch. The mechanism that prevents the escape of gas to the rear maintains pressure within the gun when it is fired and guards the breech parts from damage is called the obturator. It consists of a steel mushroom head, a spindle, a gas check pad, steel split rings, and a filling in disc. Before assembling the obturator, the gas check pad must be carefully lubricated. The first step is to cover the inside of the mushroom head with graphite grease. The gas check pad is of plastic material. Graphite grease must be applied over the entire surface and rubbed well into the pad covering. This reduces the absorption of moisture and decreases the cutting and tearing of the cover. The front outer split ring fits in a recess in the pad, between the pad and the mushroom head. The 
the inner ring goes around the spindle in a recess in the pad. The rear outer split ring fits in a recess on the rear surface of the pad. The filling in disc is then placed on top of the rear outer split ring. After the obturator has been assembled, it may be carried to the gun this way or placed on a shot truck and rolled to the gun. The obturator is installed in the breech block in this manner, the spindle extending through the block. The ball bearing type thrust bearing is inserted in the rear of the breech block around the spindle. The split nut is screwed to the spindle against the thrust bearing, holding the obturator parts in place. The rear of the block is machined out to accommodate this mechanism. The mushroom head now must be carefully adjusted. First, with the wrench provided, the spindle nut is tightened just enough to keep the gas check pad and split rings from slipping. The breech block is translated and then rotated halfway. Now with the breech mechanism in this position, the spindle nut can be screwed in snugly. clamp screw on the spindle nut is tightened. The breech block is then rotated until it is closed completely. The forward motion of the block in this operation presses the pad into the gas check seat and adjusts it properly for firing. To test the adjustment, the block is opened. Take special notice that the obturator can rotate independently of the breech block. You will see why in a moment. If the mushroom head is properly adjusted, it will turn easily, but without longitudinal play. We just saw how the obturator rotates independently of the block. Now watch the spindle. It remains stationary as the block rotates into position. Let's look at a cross section of the obturator assembled in the breech block. We have just seen that the breech block and the obturator can rotate independently of one another. This is made possible by the oil bearing surface on the rear face of the filling in disc and the ball bearing type thrust bearing mounted on the rear of the spindle. This is the gas check pad, and this the gas check seat. Now when the breech is closed, the gas check pad and rings fit snugly into the gas check seat and are held stationary while the block rotates around the spindle. If the obturator parts were not able to remain stationary while the block rotated, the rubbing of the gas check pad against the metal surfaces of the filling in disc and the gas check seat would rapidly tear the pad covering to pieces. Here you see the most important function of the obturator, to prevent the escape of gases to the rear when the gun fires. Let's go inside the breech and see what happened just now. This is a close view of the front outer split ring, the rear outer split ring, 
and the inner ring. When the gun was fired, the explosion of the powder charge applied pressure to the mushroom head, which pressed against the gas check pad, causing it to expand. This expansion forced the outer split rings very tightly against the walls of the gas check seat, thus preventing any escape of gas through the rear at these points. The inner ring served to prevent the escape of pad composition between the filling in disc and the spindle. The firing mechanism is mounted on the rear end of the obturator spindle so that it will rotate with the breech block around the spindle. To mount it, first the hinge collar is placed around the spindle. Then the safety bar is slipped into the housing. The housing is held stationary by a guide bar. The hinged collar is screwed around the housing. Notice how the safety bar automatically attaches itself to the safety bar slide. Next, the ejector is fitted into position. The slide containing the firing leaf is now inserted. Finally, the electric cable is attached to its terminal. The firing mechanism is now ready to fire either electric or friction primers. When the block is open, a primer can be inserted, but it cannot be fired. This is a friction primer. The primer fits into the primer seat. Notice that slotted part above the primer? That's the firing leaf. When the slide handle is pushed down, the firing leaf passes around the button wire of the primer. The safety bar and safety bar slide prevent the leaf from being drawn back until the block has been rotated to the closed position. As the block opens, the safety bar locks the firing leaf. An eye for attaching a lanyard is provided in the firing leaf. When the lanyard is pulled, the leaf engages the primer button, pulling the button wire to the rear. It acts just like the claw end of a hammer pulling out a nail. The end of the button wire in the primer has teeth embedded in a friction composition. The movement of the button wire as the lanyard is pulled ignites the friction composition at the other end of the wire, and it in turn ignites the charge of black powder in the primer. The flame from the primer passes through the vent in the spindle and sets off the igniting charge. This ignites the propelling charge, hurling the projectile out of the barrel. After firing, the slide handle is lifted, ejecting the primer. The firing leaf also carries electrical contact clips for use in firing an electric primer. As the slide is pushed down, the contact clips engage the primer button. On the face of the breech is a circuit breaker. This keeps the firing circuit open until the breech block is completely closed. With the breech block fully closed, pulling the magneto handle sends an electric current through the circuit to the primer button. From there, it goes through the fine wire in the primer, igniting gun cotton, which in turn sets off a black powder charge in the primer. To avoid accidents caused by premature explosion, the greatest care must be taken of the firing mechanism, and it must be tested frequently. For the test, an unfired service primer is inserted. While the breech block is slowly rotated to its firing position, a steady pull, sufficient to fire the primer, is maintained on the lanyard. Should the primer fire before the breech block has been rotated to the locked position, the firing mechanism is faulty. A similar test should be made for the electric primer. Numerous pulls on the firing magneto while the breech block is being rotated slowly will tell if the firing circuit is in proper adjustment. 
If it is, the primer will not fire until the breech block is rotated completely and the circuit closed. These safety tests for both friction and electric primers must always be made before service firing. firing of this gun at a uniform rate is largely the responsibility of the ammunition squad. The duties of the ammunition squad of all seacoast artillery batteries are the same in general. Although there are minor changes because of caliber of weapon, type of equipment, or layout of battery, the squad must be thoroughly drilled. If it is confused or inefficient, delays in loading will result. The squad must carefully prepare all ammunition and equipment used in its service. The squad of this gun consists of a chief of ammunition and 18 cannoneers, numbered 21 through 38. It is divided into two details, one for the service of powder, the other for the service of projectiles. The size of these details depends on local conditions and is determined by the battery commander. The chief of ammunition is charged with the efficient working of his squad. He records all ammunition as it is received from ordnance. He is particularly careful that the projectiles and fuses are listed under the proper name and type. The chief of ammunition also examines the projectiles to see that they are properly painted. Paint prevents rust. Projectiles must be checked at intervals while in storage. If any need painting, Members of the squad are detailed for the job. Grommets are supplied to protect the rotating bands. The projectiles are stored on dunnage, as seen here. They may also be stored on skids. The chief of ammunition notifies the chief of section of the amount of ammunition on hand and of any defects found. The temperature of the powder must be recorded if firing is to take place. If the powder has been in the magazine for less than two weeks, the temperature is taken from a thermometer inserted in one of the powder containers for at least an hour. This temperature is recorded as that of all the charges in the magazine. If the powder has been stored for more than two weeks, the temperature of the magazine itself can be recorded as the temperature of all the powder. Ammunition handling apparatus must always be kept in condition. A detail cleans and oils all trolleys. Another detail cleans and oils cranes, blocks, and chains. Another detail cleans, oils, and tests the shot hoists. It is a duty of the chief of ammunition to check their safety features. The projectile detail cleans and oils the shot trucks. Tires must be examined to be sure they're secure. All moving parts must run smoothly. The buffers are tested for adjustment and proper functioning. The trucks for this gun are equipped with hydraulic buffers. The powder detail cleans the powder serving trays and examines them to determine their serviceability. All 
all loading trays must enter the breech recess freely. The squad polices the magazines and galleries. Open drains and gutters must be swept at least once a week. Rubbish must be put where it won't be blown or washed back. The chief of ammunition is also responsible for the preparation of projectiles and powder for firing. Under his supervision, the projectile detail thoroughly cleans all projectiles to be used. Grease and oil are removed. All paint must be removed from the bourrelets. Using a fine file, the detail removes burrs and smooths all rotating bands. The chief of ammunition checks the weight against the data stenciled on the projectile. Should projectiles arrive at the battery without this data, they would have to be weighed by the ammunition squad. There are two standard weights of armor-piercing projectiles for a 12-inch gun, 975 pounds and 1,070 pounds. The detail separates projectiles of approximately the same weight into groups. A uniform group is used for any one firing. Since the mean weight is used in calculating range correction, accuracy of fire is improved by keeping the variations from the mean as small as possible. The chief of ammunition reports the weights of the projectiles to the chief of section, who transmits the information to the range officer. Here are the two types of powder charges used at a 12-inch gun battery. This charge is the live one and is covered with quick-burning silk, which leaves no residue after firing. This is a dummy charge of the same size and weight. Its covering is made out of canvas, so that it can withstand the heavy usage of practice drills. For purposes of safety, all powder scenes in this film were photographed using the dummy charge. In preparation for firing, Powder charges must be removed from their containers long enough for the chief of ammunition to test and inspect them. To guard against sparks, a tarpaulin is spread where the containers are to be opened. It is good practice for the powder detail to wear rubber sole shoes at all times. The powder cans are opened with a wooden mallet, never with a steel hammer. The powder charge is removed. The chief of ammunition examines each section to determine that it is tightly wrapped or laced. He makes sure that no section exceeds the maximum allowable diameter. A gauge for this test is furnished by the ordnance department. He checks the total length of each charge to be sure that it measures at least nine-tenths of the distance from the mushroom head to the base of the projectile. After these tests, each charge is replaced in its container and not removed again until needed at the gun. Previous to firing, the chief of ammunition sees that each primer to be used is tested. Primers are stored in a separate room, never in a powder or projectile magazine. The chief of ammunition tests all electric primers for continuity of circuit. For the test, an approved tester or a high resistance voltmeter is used. 
faulty primers may be discovered by this test and discarded. This precaution definitely reduces the number of electric primer failures. The chief of ammunition also obtains and keeps available a supply of friction primers and lanyards for immediate use in case the electric firing mechanism fails. Each friction primer is inserted in the primer seat to test it for proper fit. Extreme care must be taken to avoid handling the button wire as it is easily bent. A bent wire will result in primer failure. On guns equipped with firing mechanism model 1903, the firing leaf and slide are lowered to their firing position to make sure that they function properly with each primer. Lowering the firing leaf in this manner also serves to test the length of the button wire. In final preparation for firing, projectiles and powder charges are arranged in the most convenient manner for service of the gun. The projectile detail loads all shot trucks. The chief of ammunition is also responsible for the uninterrupted service of powder and projectiles during action. For the performance of this task, a prescribed drill is followed. But the details of serving ammunition are dependent on the layout of the battery and are worked out for each individual battery during the training period. The plan must include provisions to ensure that ammunition is always available at the emplacement and must also comply with all safety precautions. At the command, details, posts, the chief of ammunition opens all galleries and magazines and posts his squad. At the command, examine gun, he inspects the materiel under his charge. He gives instructions for the preparation of ammunition and equipment to the projectile and powder details. The projectile detail runs loaded shot trucks to the emplacement where they are turned over to the gun squad. The powder detail removes a powder charge from its container. Containers are opened only as charges are required. The charges are placed in proper order on the powder trays. The chief of ammunition checks the powder bags to determine that no defects exist. He records the weight of the charge, its lot number, and other pertinent data. He removes the powder tag. The detail first removes the cloth or paper covering from a red quilted pad at the end of the section. This contains black powder and is called an igniter. The detail makes sure that the igniter is supplied and that it is properly placed. The igniter must be securely sewed with silk threads or tied to the proper section. When the chief of ammunition is satisfied that the projectile and powder details have completed their duties, he reports to the chief of section, ammunition service in order, or reports any defect that he is unable to remedy without delay. At the command load, the serving of ammunition begins. The powder detail carries the loaded powder tray to the emplacement. Here it is turned over to the powder serving detail of the gun squad. Ordinarily, two powder serving trays are provided for each gun. During firing, the powder detail receives the empty tray from the powder serving detail and returns it to the magazine for reloading. The projectile detail receives the empty trucks from the truck detail and runs them back to the magazine for reloading. The powder detail places the empty containers where they will not interfere with the work of the squad. At the command, cease firing, 
the ammunition squad continues to prepare more ammunition for service. At the command, replace equipment, the squad returns all ammunition and equipment to its proper place. The chief of ammunition checks on all details. When the chief of ammunition is satisfied that everything is secured, he forms his squad and reports to the chief of section. To protect our seacoast from enemy naval vessels, a constant vigil must be maintained. Seacoast artillery batteries are a part of that vigil, a part of the vital defense. When the time for action comes, every piece of equipment must be ready. Coast artillerymen have confidence in their equipment. That confidence comes from the knowledge that through care and maintenance, their battery is in complete readiness at all times. Care and maintenance may sound unexciting, but upon them depends the successful action of any battery. The battery commander is responsible for successful action. He must see that all material is in the best possible condition at all times. He makes all inspections and tests necessary to ensure proper maintenance. If minor repairs are needed, they are made by the battery personnel. If major repairs are required, the battery commander requests that they be made by the proper services. One of the most important parts of the gun is the firing mechanism. When not in use, it is kept in a small box and stored in the armament chest. The firing mechanism must be handled carefully. Its parts are easily damaged if misused. The mechanism shown here is the M1903. But no matter what the model, each firing mechanism must be inspected frequently. It must always be checked before the gun is fired to be sure it is well oiled and free from dirt. To oil and clean the firing mechanism, it is first removed from the gun. The collar catch is drawn to the rear. The entire mechanism is removed by unscrewing the hinged collar. Now, to disassemble the firing mechanism, the slide stop is drawn to the left. The slide is then lifted from the housing. Next, the ejector and safety bar are removed. The firing leaf and the slide catch are separated by pressing on the split pin. This starts the split pin, and it is drawn out. The pivot is now free for removal. With the pivot out, 
the firing leaf and the slide catch are free and can be separated. By loosening the screw at the lower edge of the housing, the collar catch can be removed. The slide stop is never removed from the housing unless replacement or repair is necessary. Should it be necessary, a special wrench is used. When the firing mechanism is disassembled, the parts are cleaned and then lubricated with light machine oil. When that job is done, the entire mechanism is reassembled. This procedure is simply a reversal of the steps just described. If the slide stop had to be removed, it is replaced first. Then the collar catch. Next, the slide catch. Then the firing leaf. After this comes the pivot. Then the split pin. Now the safety bar is slipped into place. The ejector is put in position. Finally, the slide is placed on the housing. Now the entire mechanism is ready to be assembled on the gun. First, clasp the hinged collar over the end of the spindle. Make sure the collar ribs engage in the corresponding grooves of the spindle. Keep the hinge at the top. Put the mechanism over the end of the collar. Hold the mechanism steady and turn the collar to the left until the catch on the underside of the mechanism engages. This locks the mechanism in place. At the same time, watch the guide bar which projects from the right side. It must enter the groove cut for it in the breech block. Also, be sure that this pin on the safety bar slide attached to the gun enters the hole in the outer end of the safety bar. As a last check, be sure the collar has been screwed on completely and that it is locked in position. After the firing mechanism is in place, check the action of the slide carefully. You can't be sure the slide is working properly unless you check it with a primer. Insert the primer in the firing mechanism. Lower the slide until it catches in the notch of the housing. Make sure the slide goes all the way down. If an attempt is made to fire the gun with the slide in this position, the primer may be blown out to the rear and injure members of the gun squad. As a safety precaution against this, there is a safety lug on the right side of the housing.
Watch how the safety lug works. Note that the slide is not all the way down. The safety lug prevents the firing leaf from being drawn back until the slide is all the way down. With the slide down, notice how the firing leaf is free to move back. Another very important inspection is that of the firing leaf and the safety bar. These can be damaged by applying excessive force under the firing leaf to raise it. This must never be done. Any such abuse will distort or damage the firing leaf. It will also batter the safety bar seat into the side of the firing leaf. Because the safety bar holds back the firing leaf until the breech block is closed all the way, any damage to it which impairs its action will allow a premature release of the firing leaf. The gun may then be fired before the breech block is closed all the way and locked. Result? Serious injury. Perhaps fatal injuries to members of the gun squad. As a final check on the firing mechanism, inspect the spring that holds the firing leaf against the slide. If it is too weak to hold the leaf against the slide, it must be replaced. Once a firing mechanism has been found to function satisfactorily with a gun, it is stamped with a serial number. This is always the same as the serial number of the gun. Gun and firing mechanism with matched serial numbers are used together to ensure a proper functioning. At least twice a month, the traversing mechanism is tested. The carriage is traversed each way throughout its entire field of movement. Carriages and guns should not be allowed to stand for long periods of time at any particular azimuth. This might cause uneven settling of the platform. The elevating mechanism is also tested twice a month. The gun is elevated and depressed throughout its entire movement. When not in use, keep the gun at an elevation of five degrees. Be especially careful that rust is kept from all parts of the carriage at all times. If rust is found, first soften it with cleaning solvent. Then use crocus cloth to remove the rust spots. Never use sandpaper, emery cloth, or any other abrasive. This illustration demonstrates how such abrasives will wear down the metal itself. You can see that this can increase the space between working parts of the gun. To prevent such increased clearances, it is important to use great care in removing rust from bearing parts. This is especially true of the piston rods. After rust has been removed, grease thoroughly. The hydraulic recoil system must be inspected carefully. Repair any leaks in the system immediately. This work should be done by skilled mechanics from ordnance. 
Repack the stuffing boxes when necessary. This work is also done by trained enlisted men or by skilled mechanics from ordnance. At least once every three months, the recoil cylinders are drained and refilled. To empty the cylinders, the filling plug is first taken off. The valve is then opened, allowing the oil to drain out. To refill the recoil cylinder on the M1917 12-inch barbet carriage, number 12 fits the two parts of the pipe together. Number 13 attaches the pipe to the filling plug. Meanwhile, number 12 attaches the funnel on the upper platform. Then number 12 fills the cylinder with light recoil oil. This draining and refilling is done every three months. But in addition, every six months, the recoil cylinders are cleaned after draining. After inspection by the gun commander, numbers 12 and 13 screw in the plugs tightly. All oil holes of the gun must be cleaned frequently to keep them free of sand or grit. Before oiling, wipe off any dirt or grit that might be carried by the oil down into the bearing. The screw plugs for the oil holes are always in place, but are removed for oiling. All grease and oil cups are painted red. Oil or grease openings and industrial type oil fittings are circled in red. The next check is the test and adjustment of the obturator. The assembling of the obturator was thoroughly covered in the previous training film on breech mechanisms. In this film, we are concerned with the check of the adjustment. Remember, the adjustment is proper if the spindle has no longitudinal play, but can be turned freely by rotating the mushroom head. After a few rounds have been fired, Again, check the spindle of the obturator for any longitudinal play. If there is any, repeat adjustment operations on the obturator. Always make this adjustment with the breech block fully translated and rotated halfway into firing position in order to prevent injury to the gas check pad. If, however, after the gun is fired, there is no longitudinal play of the spindle, and it can be turned freely by means of the mushroom head, the obturator is properly adjusted. Sponging solution is used to extinguish burning residue in the chamber. It also serves to lubricate the breech recess. The desired solution contains one pound of Castile soap dissolved in four gallons of water. If Castile soap is not available, plain water may be used. Yellow soaps are not used because they leave a gummy deposit on the breech recess. To avoid handling large receptacles, dissolve the required amount of soap in a bucket of hot water. Stir as little as possible to prevent foaming a highly concentrated soap solution will result.
The solution is added to water in the sponge tub to bring the mixture to the proper proportion. Because a gun sweats after it has been fired, the bore must be cleaned, dried, and oiled immediately after firing and daily thereafter until sweating stops. To clean the bore, a cleaning solution is made by dissolving one half pound of soda ash for each gallon of boiling water. The bore is washed with this solution using a bore sponge wrapped with burlap. Take care when cleaning not to rub the staves of sponges or brushes against the lower portion of the bore. This causes excessive wearing of the lands. As soon as the bore is clean, new burlap is wrapped around the sponge and the bore is then wiped thoroughly dry. When all sweating has stopped, the bore is coated with rust preventive compounds if the gun is to remain idle. This compound is either heavy or medium, depending on local climatic conditions. If heavy rust preventive is to be used, it is heated to approximately 180 degrees before application. If it is known that the gun might be fired again in a short while, rust preventive compound is not applied. Instead, the gun is oiled daily. Each step in care and maintenance may in itself be small, but put together they are part of an important coordination. Attention to detail results in confidence and confidence results in successful action. Before firing, the battery commander checks and inspects all materiel to make sure that everything is in excellent working order. He studies the emplacement book and records of previous firings. Special attention is given to records of malfunctions, such as misfires. Careful attention to sources of past difficulties helps to prevent the recurrence of similar failures.
Under the supervision of the chief of breach, the breach detail dismantles the obturator. They clean and lubricate it. Then they reassemble and adjust the obturator for firing. The gun commander supervises the refilling of the recoil cylinder. Oil is added to the cylinder until it overflows. Then the gun commander tests the firing mechanism of the gun. He makes sure that the safety features work properly, as explained in the training films on safety precautions. He next inspects the bore and powder chamber to see that they are clean thoroughly. The traversing mechanism of the gun is tested for freedom of operation. The gun commander determines that this freedom is assured in both directions. The elevating mechanism is checked for freedom of operation in both directions. First, the gun is elevated and depressed by the hand crank. Then it is elevated and depressed by using power. The gun commander continues his inspection by checking the clearance of the anti-friction devices by means of a feeler gauge. He supervises the oiling to see that nothing is overlooked. Then he makes sure that all grease cups are filled and properly adjusted. On guns using case 2 pointing, the gun pointer would now check the sight. If it needs adjustment, he sees that the necessary steps are taken. Immediately before any action takes place, the range section makes all preparations for the calculation of firing data. Telephone operators test all communication lines. Equipment is checked frequently under the direction of the range officer to be sure it is in adjustment. Meteorological observations are made and the data recorded by an operator at the meteorological station. The height of tide is noted and recorded at the tide station. The height of tide and the meteorological data are transmitted to the plotting room where an operator records them. The battery executive transmits all data regarding weights of projectiles to the range officer. This information must be in the hands of the range officer well in advance of the time the projectiles are to be used. The range officer obtains the record of the previous performances of the powder lot on hands from the emplacement book. The range officer must also obtain the powder's present temperature. He also records the powder tag markings. The range officer determines beforehand the muzzle velocity to be assumed with any combination of projectile and powder charge likely to be used. Whenever possible, 
the battery commander gives to the range officer advance notice of the combination that will be used. The battery commander gives the same information to the battery executive. The battery executive receives the report of the chief of section. Satisfied that the section is ready for firing, he reports to the battery commander. The range officer makes a final checkup on trotting room equipment. When he is certain that everything is in order, he makes his report to the battery commander. As soon as the target is sighted, the group commander assigns it to a particular battery. The commander of that battery receives the order and in turn assigns the target to the various elements of his battery. He verifies that his previous decision is satisfactory as to the choice of ammunition, observation and spotting stations, and method of pointing. As soon as the assignments and the decisions are made, the range section immediately begins to operate the equipment. The prime object of the range section is to determine the range and azimuth at which the gun must be set for firing at a particular instant. When the data is computed, it is transmitted to the gun. At the gun, the data is chalked up on the display boards as a check for the azimuth setter and the range setter. At the emplacement, when the battery executive gives the command target, the gun pointer sets the azimuth index to the azimuth sent from the plotting room. During the time the range section is computing firing data, the ammunition squad is bringing up the proper ammunition. The gun squad is preparing to load. The battery commander checks the reports from the various sections as they come in. When he is satisfied that the battery is ready to open fire, the command, commence firing, goes to all elements of the battery. The gun commander gives the order, I'm at firing, load. At this command, number four opens the breech and holds back the breech block. Numbers nine and 10 run the loaded shot truck forward. The chief of breech and numbers one, two, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15 man the rammer. Number one places the head of the rammer against the base of the projectile while the truck moves forward. Other men in the rammer detail follow the truck. When the truck strikes the face of the breach, number 10 sets the brake. In one motion, using the greatest possible force, the rammer detail seats the projectile. They move back far enough to allow the powder to be served. Nine and 10 turn the truck over to the projectile detail. 16, 17, 18, and 19 carry the powder tray to the breech and insert its nose into the breech recess. The chief of breech gives the command, ram. The ramming detail shoves the powder charge into the powder chamber. The powder is left so that the breech block in closing will give it a final push. Numbers 11, 12, and 13 carry the rammer back to its position and stand ready to ram the next shot. The powder serving detail removes the tray and turns it over to the ammunition squad for reloading. Number four closes the breech. After the breech is closed and rotated, number three inserts an electric primer. He then lowers the firing leaf and steps back to the right rear. The chief of breach commands, elevate. The range setter elevates the gun. He 
delays it for the range posted on the display board and calls... Range set! The gun is traversed at the same time by numbers seven and eight under the direction of the gun pointer. The gun pointer sees that the gun is laid on the azimuth sent from the plotting room. He calls... Azimuth set! The time interval bell gives the signal for firing. Fire! Number two pulls the magneto handle. As soon as the gun is fired, the gun section moves back into position for reloading. The range setter has the piece brought to the loading position. Number four opens the breech block. Number 20 prepares the sponge and allows the excess liquid to run off. He carries the sponge to the breech. With the aid of numbers one and two, he sponges the chamber. Number three removes the old primer. He takes the primer vent cleaner and cleans the primer seat. Firing is continuous until further commands are given. A first-rate gun section will perform the reloading operation without a single wasted motion. The entire operation from firing one round to complete readiness for firing the next can be accomplished by a well-trained, efficient squad in approximately 55 seconds. Instead of firing electrically, as you have just seen, the gun also may be fired by using a friction primer and lanyard. In this case, after the breech is closed, number three inserts a friction primer and completely lowers the firing leaf. The chief of breech hooks the lanyard to the firing leaf. Number three steps back to the right rear and uncoils the lanyard. At the command, he pulls Fire! the lanyard. As soon as the piece is brought to loading position, number three coils the lanyard, and the chief of breach unhooks it from the firing leaf. Some batteries are equipped with a combination truck, which carries both projectile and powder. In such cases, no powder tray is needed, and the loading procedure is slightly different. After the projectile is rammed home, numbers 16, 17, 18, and 19 shift the powder charge into position for serving. The powder is rammed home, and the truck is turned over to the ammunition squad for reloading. After the breech is closed and locked, the primer is inserted. The new range and azimuth are set. At the proper TI bell, the gun is fired. At the command, keep firing. The display board operators continue to post and record data. The gun pointer continues setting according to the data posted. Numbers seven and eight continue to traverse the piece while all other men at the gun stand by awaiting further orders. At the command, cease tracking, the chief of section repeats the command. The men at the display board stop posting data. All men stand by waiting for further orders. The range section ceases operations. When the battery executive commands replace equipment the members of the various details secure all equipment and proceed to the work of care and maintenance.
Because powder residue must be removed from the bore when firing is completed, the gun is carefully cleaned and oiled. When cleaning and oiling is finished and the breech block closed, numbers one and four cover the breech. 14 puts on the muzzle cover. All equipment is replaced, material is secured, the emplacement is policed. The gun commander then forms his section and marches them off. <laughs>